Welcome to TSAT. In the previous session, we discussed about measures of income and then we discussed about the topics of inflation and monetary policy. Now, let us continue with our discussion related to Indian economy. Okay. We will be discussing as part of this as public finance. In simply speaking, okay, to make things simple, let us refer this as fiscal policy. I mean, this is how it would be how been very popular. Okay. So, you might have heard of the term personal finance, that means how you and me make money and manage our money. So, how much we spend, how much we invest, how do we invest, where do we invest, what are the returns upon the money we invest. Okay. So, that is what is the personal finance is. Same logic could be extended to corporate finance. How do companies raise money, where do they invest money, upon the money invested, how much return they make, that is a corporate finance. But when it comes to public finance, you know who does, okay, what does public refer to? You, okay, I mean, the in fact, when I say public finance, it only refers to the government. So, how does government finance its okay, money? I mean, how does government raise money? How does government spend money? Agar in case the government spending is more than its income, okay, where does the government raise money to meet its okay, deficits? So, this part is what we discuss as a public finance. So, when it comes to public finance, I only refer to the finance related to the government of India. So, in this part, we will be discussing or referring the same more or less as part of fiscal policy. If you look at the word fiscal, in fact, it refers to government's okay, finances, that is it. So, fiscal, the literal meaning of the word fiscal does mean treasury. That is the reason I happen to place this image here. So, the Italian meaning, okay, fiscal is derived from the word fiscus. Which in Italian, it does mean, fiscus does mean treasury. So, in good old days, kings used to maintain this treasury, isn't it? So, all the revenue collected from the people is what they used to maintain in the treasure and that out of this treasure, people used to make spending out of it. In the modern days, we do not have any such things, isn't it? What is that we have in the modern days is what we call as, before going into the objectives, let me define what exactly the modern ways the government maintains its funds. So, if you look at in the modern days, the government of India, whatever the revenues it receives from the public is maintained as part of consolidated fund of uh, India. Isn't it? If we do not have any something, something called a treasury where the money that we happen to pay in the form of taxes goes into. So, what exactly is the way government maintains or finances are the money that has been collected from the people, it goes into a fund called consolidated fund of uh, India. So, what does it says? All revenues raised by the government, money borrowed and received from loans. I mean anything in the form of income to the government of India or any amount of money in the form of borrowings of the government of India would flow into consolidated fund of India. And it is from this consolidated fund of India, the government is obliged to spend this money and any penny the government spends from the consolidated fund of India, the government is answerable to the parliament in a way it is answerable to the public of this country, isn't it? Because the one who sits in parliament is none other than the representatives of people, isn't it? And that is the very basic purpose of submitting budget to the parliament. So, the money the government raises in the form of taxes and various other means okay? and the money the government borrows to meet its uh, excess expenditure, all that money happened to traditionally flow into a fund called consolidated fund of uh, India. So, now let us look at the definition, all revenues raised by the government, money borrowed and received from loans given by the government flow into it. All government expenditure other than certain ex exceptional items made from contingency fund and public account are made from this account. No money can be appropriated, that means no money could be spent or shared with any other people or any other state governments from the fund except in accordance with the law. So, without any law approved from the parliament, okay, without any approval from the parliament, the government has no right to spend a single penny out of concerned fund of uh, India. So, now let us look at the two other accounts of government of India. The second is contingency fund. A fund placed at the disposal of the president to enable him or her to make advances to the executive or government to meet urgent unforeseen expenditure. So, contingency is something like an emergency fund. Like we regularly people happen to maintain some emergency fund to meet our contingency. Similarly, the government also happens to have a certain emergency fund at its disposal wherein the government has a right to spend without any prior approval from the parliament and this emergency fund is what is very commonly referred as contingency fund of uh, India. The third and most important is what is public account. The third fund that okay, out of the three funds happens to be public account and according to article 266 class 1. This okay, of the constitution of India, public account is used in relation to all the funds flows where the government is acting as a banker. What do you mean by government acting as a banker? Most of you might heard about small savings schemes, post office small savings schemes. Similarly, the government, okay, you might also happen to see if your parents are from government employees, okay, they would be saving certain amount of money with the government in the form of provident funds. So, provident fund is something like a saving scheme of the okay, provided by the government of India. So, if you are an employee, you could save some of your regular earnings with the government of India and you know the fact, okay, the new pension scheme and all these things we are not discussing. But whatever the money you pool 
Okay, so this is the money along with interest is what you get paid in a lump sum amount at the time of retirement, isn't it? So this particular provident fund that people happen to save is the money that they save with the bank upon which the bank also uh, when it is money they save with the government and government in this case acts as a banker. So it keeps this money with it and might use this money for itself. But at the end of the day, this is the money the government pays along with interest rate to the people who ever happen to park it with itself. Uh, in the form of a provident fund. So all such amount of money which happens to be the savings of public which happens to be ideally the money that okay, flows from the public and since it is a public money, isn't it? Let us look at the difference between the provident fund and small savings. A provident fund is simply a person's income, some proportion of income he is saving with the government. Whether a tax is something that we are obliged to pay and the tax we pay is a revenue to the government but public account or simply the provident fund or the money you contribute to the provident fund is our money that is what we are saving with the government and that cannot be called as government money and henceforth any such savings of the public may be in the form of post office savings or national small savings certificate or in the form of provident funds is the savings of the public is the earnings of the public and that is the reason that has been maintained as a separate account with the government of India and that account is what we refer as public account. So, all the money that flows to the government of India is broadly more or less maintained in three different accounts. One is Concert Fund of India, the major account and then the contingency which is for an emergency purpose and the third is the public account where all the fund that where people happen to park with government as banker India. So, now let us go back and discuss about what exactly is the fiscal policies. So, if you look at the word fiscal policy, Simply speaking, fiscal policy is the policy that deals with the income and expenditure of the government. Fiscal policy is the policy that deals with the income and expenditure of the government. So, what is the major source of income to the government? Taxation. And that is the basic reason whenever it comes to the fiscal policy, people refer these two terms. One is taxation and expenditure. Okay. So, in order to understand this topic better, we will be discussing taxation as a separate topic and in this particular lecture, okay, in the, for the purpose of giving a brief introduction of fiscal policy, we will be briefly discussing okay, the budget of this year along with how it is presented and the components of budget that helps in understanding fiscal policy better. So, what exactly in the name of fiscal policy the government does? It manages, fiscal policy is all about managing income and expenditure of the government and managing debt and investments. Because if, okay, let us say if a person or an entity or simply the government might have some income and also has certain amount of expenditure, it is not necessary for an individual or for a company or for a government to always have their income exactly matching with the, their expenditures, isn't it? And that is the basic reason along with managing income and expenditure, the government also does the job of managing its debt and that is what the fiscal policy is all about and that is what we will be discussing as part of this first part of the session that is public finance part 1. So, what are the basic objectives of public finance? What is the public finance? Like monetary policy, we have happened to come up with three different objectives. Promoting growth and employment, maintaining price stability, okay, ensuring exchange rate stability. Similarly, what are the things that public finance or this particular fiscal policy tries to achieve? The first and foremost objective is to manage public needs. In a way, the purpose of public finance and the purpose of government playing certain proactive role in economy is to provide those goods and services that the markets cannot efficiently provide let us say defending this nation, providing some public communities. So, whatever the goods and services the markets are cannot afford, cannot provide or markets are not good at providing it, that is what the government okay, happens to take the initiative and in fact the government takes a proactive role in supplementing the market forces. The second is to promote economic development, to boost growth and employment economy and ensure the growth or the fruits of growth would be fairly distributed among the people. So, not only concentrate on economic growth, also ensure that okay, the development in the economy would also take place, that is the second. Remove inequalities, reduce the inequalities, how come? By ensuring or by helping those people who are in need and try to create level playing platform within the society. The fourth objective is to maintain price stability and I guess you understand what is the meaning of the word price stability. So, broadly the very basic purpose of fiscal policy is to achieve these four objectives. Okay? So, like we have discussed about monetary policy, fiscal policy is all about taxation or income and expenditure. Something very similar to monetary policy, the fiscal policy actions of the government could also be of two different kinds, expansionary policy or contractionary policy. Now, let us say I started okay, in, uh, introducing fiscal policy is the policy that deals with the taxation and uh, expenditure. Now, let us see how these particular changes in taxation expenditure would have an impact on the economy. Now, let us say, imagine the government reduces taxes, 
if the government is reducing taxes. When the tax burden, let's say whether it's an income tax, I mean whether it's a direct tax or indirect tax. Let's say for this example, let's say the government reduces GST on all goods and services. I mean a 12 percent category of goods, now they attract only 6 percent GST, 18 percent attract only okay, 12 percent. So let's say imagine the government has reduced the tax burden or reduced the tax rates on all goods and services. So when the tax rates in the economy comes down, what do you think is the impact upon the consumption? Obviously, one can easily okay, anticipate when the tax rates decreases, consumption increases. When consumption increases, this means the demand is increasing. Isn't it? I mean, the consumption of goods and services increases means the demand increases. So, that is how the economy gets revived by reducing taxes. Similarly, okay, when the government starts spending more and more amount of money, let us say the government spending money in the form of subsidies or in the form of freebies or welfare expenditure or in the form of investments in a infrastructure. So, whenever government spends any amount of money, at the end of the day, who happen to benefit out of it? It is simply the economy and the people within the economy gets benefited. As a result, increase in spending would also result in boosting the demand. Henceforth, these policy actions of government reducing tax rates and increasing expenditure, okay, could be called as an expansionary policy because this action would result in revival of economic growth and boost investments in the economy. And that is the basic reason the policy actions of government, okay, by increasing expenditure and reducing taxation would have a very positive impact on the economy which helps in the revival and promoting growth and employment in the economy. If the government does exactly opposite to what we discussed, let us say the government has reduced the expenditure. The amount of money the government is spending has been reduced because the government cannot afford to spend a large amount of money. For some reasons, imagine the government spending has reduced. Similarly, the government for the sake of mobilizing huge amount of revenue okay, has increased the tax rates. So, exactly opposite to what has been discussed in the okay, previous case. Imagine if the government does the opposite, that is increase the tax rates to a very high level and reduce the expenditure to a such a large extent. In such case, what happens? That would result in fall in overall demand in the economy, what I call aggregate demand in the economy. Such actions many a times would help in decreasing the demand. When the demand decreases, obviously the phenomenon of further rise in price could be controlled. So, that is how the policy actions of the government of India by reducing expenditure, increasing taxes would also reduce the overall demand which might help in fighting inflation. But you might have noticed the fact it is hardly, okay, it is rarely any government could afford to do such things. Okay, Do not you really think when government reduces expenditure and increases taxes, the government would become very unpopular among the people and that is the reason though government has the strength and ability to control inflation by reducing its own expenditure and increasing tax rates to make the goods and services relatively costly, thereby discourage consumption. But you hardly find government simply taking these kind of policy actions to contain inflation. Okay? And that is the very particular reason why in most of the democratic countries like India and United States of America, you might have noticed the fact that the inflation is a job that is mostly left to monetary authorities. And in the previous two sessions, when it comes to monetary policy and inflation, we already discussed about monetary policy framework agreement made by RB, between RBI and government of India and the concept of inflation targeting, is not it? So, why is the RBI has been asked to target inflation rather than the government of India? Because government's actions would result in unpopulistic initiatives and no populist or no democratic government could end up becoming unpopular and that is the reason, okay. It is very rarely you come across this scenario of government going for a contractionary policy. Government is always interested in expanding the economy by boosting its spending, okay. So, now coming to back to what exactly is the fiscal policy, as I already made it clear, to understand fiscal policy better, it is very easy if you could understand the concept of union budget. Okay? So, rather than this word called union budget, I would be happy referring this particular okay, statement as annual financial statement. So, according to article 112, okay, the government is obliged to submit a statement, what we call annual financial statement and as you know any financial statement, any financial statement, profit loss statement, income expenditure statement, okay, cash flow statements, balance sheets, any financial statements simply consist of information related to inflow, how much money coming in and information related to outflow, how much money going out of the okay, exchequer or how much money coming in and how much money going out, inflow, outflow or revenue or expenditure, is not it? So, that is what simply an annual financial statement consists of and this annual financial statement is what is very simply referred as a union budget. 
So like in the monetary policy I said, the RBI would have an annual policy. Similarly, in India, when it comes to fiscal policy, the government of India happened to submit an annual fiscal policy or an annual financial statement to the government, okay, to the parliament. Because you know the fact every year on 1st of February or 1st working day of February, it's a practice in India that on every first working day of February, generally in good old days, I mean somewhere before 2016, 17, okay, so I mean five years by lay, it used to be on the last working day of February. The budget used to be submitted in the last working day of February, but recently there has been a considerable change wherein the budget submission happens to be pre to the first working day, not exactly on the first of February, first working day. What is the work to, I mean, when I say working day, it's the working day of parliament. And the first working day of parliament, okay, the budget has been presented. One day prior to submitting budget, the government also submits an economic survey. So what is an economic survey consist of? Economic survey would help in understanding the state of economy in that particular financial year. So let's say, okay, when the budget is submitted for financial 22-23, that's mean that's going to start on 1st April and on 31st March of the next calendar year 23, the government, okay, has also submitted, I mean, the finance minister also has submitted one statement along with it, that is none other than the economic survey, which helps in understanding state of economy for the financial year that has been already completed, that is for 21-22. So in a way, the finance minister is telling the people of this country that this is what my state of economy in this financial year 21-22. And for the coming financial year, this is my financial plan. This is how I'm going to raise money, how I'm going to spend money. And that particular piece of paper or this financial statement submitted to the parliament. Why should the finance minister has to submit budget to the parliament? The reason is because, okay, you know, democratic form of government is a responsible form of government and all the money the finance minister or the government of India is raising is the money from the public. It is from our pockets and every penny the government spends is again the money that we happen to own it and henceforth, since the money is collected from the public and money is meant for the public, without the consent of the representatives of the public, the government has no right to spend a single penny and that's the very basic purpose of submitting budget to the parliament. And most of you also have noticed the fact, though budget is submitted in both the houses of the parliament, only the people or simply the members of Lok Sabha are allowed to vote upon the budget. The reason is the members of Lok Sabha being the representatives of people, whereas the members of Rajya Sabha, I guess you know the fact they are members of, they are the representatives of states. So that's the very basic purpose of submitting budget to the parliament, just to take the consent of the public. Okay. So along with this particular initiative of pre pouring budget, the other two things I just want you to remember is the government has been in good old days, the government used to segregate the expenditure into plan expenditure and non plan expenditure, which we'll be discussing in a couple of minutes. But the second most important fact that you need to remember along with the pre pouring budget submission from last working day of February to first working day of February, the second important, the government has done away with this practice of segregating expenditure to plan and non-plan. That's the second important thing. And the other initiative that you need to notice is the government some five, six years back used to submit a separate budget, okay, general budget and railway budget. But right now, rail budget or railway budget has been included as part of our general budget. So these are the three major initiatives that you should be noticing as part of Okay, budget submission in the recent past or the initiative taken by the current government of India. So now let's look at this statement. What exactly is the budget is? Union budget is most comprehensive. It's simply the comprehensive report of government finances in which revenues from all sources and outlets for all activities. I mean, how am I moving, going to mobilize money? How much is going to be my tax income? How much is through my disinvestment proceeds? How much money I'm raising through borrowings? Okay. And then how am I going to disburse these funds? Okay, how much money goes for revenue expenditure? How much goes for capital expenditure? Isn't it? So that particular financial statement submitted for a span of one year to the parliament is what we simply call it as a union budget or an annual financial statement. Okay, now let's go ahead and try to understand the components of a budget. Okay. So if you look at when we come to budget, since look at on the first working day, if you look at this year budgets has been submitted on the first working day of February 2022. So in fact, in the financial year, okay, 21-22, because this particular date falls in the financial of 21-22. But the finance minister has submitted the budget that's going to start on 1st April 22 and that budget, okay, I mean for the financial that's going to end on 31st March 23, isn't it? 
So that's the basic reason. Whenever the finance minister happens to submit a budget sheet, we call the budget estimate. Okay, we call that as a budget estimate because she is anticipating, she is forecasting. This is what I am expecting to rise, and this is what I am expected to spend. Okay. So we already have seen the different accounts of India. Now let's look at what exactly okay, the budget consists of. So ideally, the budget consists of or the annual finance statement do consist of two different bills. One is a finance bill. The other is a appropriation bill. One is a finance bill. The other is a appropriation bill. So now let's look at what is a finance bill. The bill produced immediately after the presentation of union budget detailing the imposition abolition alteration of regulation of taxes proposed in the budget so in fact if you look at the entire budget it do consist of these statements okay one is the finance bill so the finance bill is simply a okay, okay, bill that has been proposed by the government which happens to speak about the okay any change in taxes increase in tax abolition of a tax or altering a tax rate any such proposals would be part of this so called finance bill in fact along with this so called submission of budget sheet with estimates of revenue and expenditure one particular statement that is submitted by the government to the parliament is the finance bill okay so it deals with all the proposals related to rising money from the public in the form of taxes the appropriation bill deals with how this money is going to be appropriated or going to be okay shared between the center and states and how much proportion of money goes for what kind of expenditure everything would be part of this appropriation bill so once this bill finance bill and appropriation bill get passed in the parliament the budget is deemed to be passed so now let's go ahead and understand the components of a budget so as such i already made it clear budget is commonly referred as an annual financial statement and any financial statement do consist of receipts and expenditure so we'll start with okay what constitute the receipts of the government of india and what constitute the expenditure of government of india i mean the components of receipts and expenditure okay so we'll start with initially receipts and then we'll just go ahead with the expenditure and i just also want you to make it clear when it comes to the term receipt okay i don't mean receipt i don't mean that exactly is nothing but income okay receipt simply does mean all the money that flows into consolidated fund of india all the money that goes into consolidated fund of india that could be in the form of income or mostly in the form of tax revenue and that tax revenue could be in the form of direct taxes indirect taxes okay or through disinvestment proceeds or by selling some natural resources anyway it could also include it would also include typically borrowings so okay keep it okay just keep this information with you that's receipts includes both income and borrowings receipt doesn't okay refer to only income of the government of india okay and then the second part is what is called the expenditure which we will be discussing in couple of minutes after we look at revenue and capital receipts so this receipts at the inflow to the consolidated fund of india is further classified into two different categories what is revenue receipt and the other is capital receipt so when it comes to revenue and capital receipts what's the very okay difference between this revenue so to make things simple and to let you remember easy okay i'll just simply differentiate in a very small okay in a very simple way so anything that recurs i mean anything that recurs i mean anything that happens repeat with certain time period certain some time interval we generally refer as revenue receipts okay so any such transaction which doesn't recur doesn't repeat with certain time period we call them as capital receipts okay let me give a very simple example let's say if you are living in a rented flat the rent you are paying is your exp regular expenditure or recurring expenditure the rent that the landlord receives is his recurring income or what you call revenue receipt let's say the flat in which you are simply residing or simply been rented by you has been purchased one fine day you happen to purchase the flat so the money you spend on buying the flat is your capital expenditure or the money that the owner of that particular flat receives after selling it is what you call his capital receipt because you don't buy the flat every month and you're not obliged to but if you are a tenant you need to keep the rent okay you need to pay the rent on a regular basis that is on a monthly basis maybe on a quarterly basis based upon the type of agreement so anything that repeats or that recurs we categorize as part of revenue that's a simple way of define okay remembering it okay and anything that in general doesn't recur is what we call as a capital receipt okay so let me give some certain examples of revenue receipts what are the examples of revenue receipts can i call tax revenue isn't it a tax revenue and this tax revenue could be a direct tax revenue or indirect tax revenue i mean to say income tax is a fine example of direct tax corporate tax is a fine example of a direct tax similarly when it comes to indirect tax you know one popular tax that is none other than gst isn't it so they are generally best examples of revenue receipts 
okay and it's not necessary revenue receipt should only be in the form of tax receipts you could also have non tax receipts non tax receipts i mean receipts to the government of india which is not in the form of tax revenue a simple example is let's say a state government has borrowed money from the center upon the loans borrowed from the center if the state is making any interest payments to the center interest payments made interest payments made by the states to the center could be a fine example of non tax receipts similarly the user charges fines okay university fees okay any receipt anything that is a regular flow to the government but not necessary in the form of tax could be a better example of a non tax receipt like i said interest payments made by the states upon the loans borrowed to the center okay the user fee and all the such kind of court fees all such kind of examples could be better example of non tax receipts and coming to capital receipts what constitute capital receipts i said rece received as mean inflow and what is a capital receipt anything that might not necessarily repeat tax okay that keeps repeating every quarter people okay isn't it or every month people file gst returns so this is how these receipts keeps repeating isn't it but whereas when it comes to capital receipt okay let's say a state has repaid the loans a state has a repaid loan okay loans repaid loans repaid by the states or similarly the government has gone for selling some assets let's say the proceeds from disinvestment government has simply sold certain part of stock okay, stake in some hpcl or ongc or steel authority of okay sale whatever it could be isn't it so if the government happen to sell certain part of its assets to the markets and raises money even the proceeds from disinvestment could be a perfect example of capital receipt and the other most important example okay best example for capital receipt is the borrowings okay so the borrowing that government makes from the market is one good example of a capital receipt so by the end of the day when it comes to the first part of this okay annual finance statement we are discussing about the receipt side of the budget and i just want you to remember the fact that receipt doesn't necessarily mean only income okay it could also include okay income and also borrowings and this particular receipts is again categorized into revenue and capital receipts revenue is something that recurs or repeats with a certain time period and capital receipts is something that might not necessarily repeat with a certain time period hence both and i also have given examples and these are simply examples of these kind of receipts but i have not given you the exhaustive list of all revenue and capital receipts so i my purpose of giving these examples is to let you understand if you have been given any economic transaction okay you would be able to figure it out whether it's a revenue receipt or capital receipt to the government of uh, india so in this particular part of session what we discussed is what's the per, okay what is a fiscal policy the objectives of fiscal policy how the government of india happened to formulate fiscal policy okay i mean the purpose of economic survey the annual finance statement and then i mean what exactly is the budget estimates and then the finance bill appropriation bill and we started okay understanding the components of budget and the first part we discussed is the receipts side of the budget okay so what are the various types of receipts uh, the revenue capital receipts and certain examples and in the next session we look at the expenditure side of the budget okay before going into it we also try to figure out certain important factual information related to the current year budget so this particular part of session as part of fiscal policy i'll try to also cover certain okay certain important aspects of the current financial years budget so how much is the receipts and where does the major source of receipts comes to the government of india and where exactly the government spends the money what part of rupee goes to what particular economic transaction is what we will be discussing in the next particular session thank you